Um, I, I think that I would have been, have been very influenced by Marshall McLuhan, the 1960s media theorist who said the medium is the message. In other words, that the process by which we take in information and we put out information is actually more important than the content of that information. And my background is, is I've done many years of vascular surgery, many of which have been operating on carotid arteries to the brain. So I've long been fascinated by the very different functions between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere of the human brain. So um, this got me thinking because I went on an archaeological tour many years ago and our group had the good fortune to have as its guide this incredibly knowledgeable University of Athens professor who told us essentially the same story wherever we went. She said, you know, these temples that you stand before, whether they're dedicated to Zeus or Poseidon or Apollo, she said these were all consecrated to a goddess at one time. And then unknown persons came along and changed that. So the essence of my book is the question that there's indisputable evidence um, from archaeological and historical records that there was a time when men all over the world worshipped women. I mean, Japan and China, uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, Rome. I mean, the, those rough, tough warriors in Athens voted to have Athena look over them rather than Poseidon. That's why it's called Athens. So my question is, is that if everyone used to worship a woman, and then beginning about 3,000 years ago with the start of Western culture, there's three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that denied the existence of a goddess, what event in culture could have been so immense and so pervasive that it changed the sex of God? How, how did we go from a, from a female deity to a male one? And um, the more I thought about this, it occurred to me that this all changed in culture about the same time that people learned how to read and write. And the first forms of writing, uh, hieroglyphics and cuneiform, were extremely difficult to learn and they were limited to a very small um, percentage, less than 2% of the population of Egypt and Mesopotamia could read and write. And there's an old saying that in the Valley of the Blind, the one-eyed man is king. If you know how to read and write, nobody else does. Within a very short period of time, you gain all the power. And then about 3,500 years ago, a group of people halfway between Mesopotamia and Egypt figured out a much simpler way to read and write called the alphabet. And the alphabet transformed the world. The alphabet continues to transform the world. And the reason why is that alphabets are so simple to learn that a four-year-old can learn the alphabet. I mean, Forrest Gump can learn the alphabet. So the reason I consider reading and writing so very different than speaking and listening is that it reconfigures the brain. I mean, um, reading and writing is a very linear sequential process, whereas speaking and listening uh, engages many more senses and it's a much more holistic kind of processing. So the left hemisphere processes linear and sequential information such as language and algebra and reason and logic. And the right hemisphere processes, and again, I'm talking about right-handed people here, processes primarily holistic image gestalt information such as recognizing images, you know, uh, seeing patterns, recognizing how the parts fit with the whole. So as a result, I've, um, I concluded that, that learning how to read and write an alphabet changes, reconfigures, literally, the brain of anybody that learns this skill. And this has been confirmed by um, brain scans on non-literate people compared to literate people. And my question is, what happens to a culture when their brains are reconfigured in such a way that a lot of people learn this skill, how does it cause the whole culture to change? What happens to the religion, the organization? What happens to the relationship between men and women? And I concluded that this was a pervasive, powerful idea. When you speak and listen, I mean, when, when you're listening to me right now, you, you know, what's happening is that your, your left hemisphere is following what I'm saying in a very linear fashion. But your right hemisphere is watching me. You know, you're, 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 checking, out, you're checking me out. You want to see if I have dandruff on my shoulders or alcohol on my breath. Or, you know, you want to uh, see how sincere I am. I mean, if I was drumming my fingertips on a tabletop, you know, your peripheral vision would pick that up. And that would go into the 
mix of what's going in, what's going on in this conversation. I mean, we all tuned into the presidential debates not because we didn't know what these guys were going to say. We wanted to see how they said it. I mean, the Chinese have a wonderful aphorism: "Let us draw closer to the fire, that we might better be able to see what we are saying." So, uh, I mean, how many times have you spoken to somebody and they're agreeing with you and they're going like this, and you know that this is the more valid message? So, when you listen to somebody, there's a lot of cross communication between the two hemispheres to ferret out the message, and then. When I speak, Broca's area in my left hemisphere is, is creating these sentences that I'm speaking. But to, to articulate speech, I need the cooperation of both sides of my lips, tongue, and vocal cords. So if I've been to the dentist, and I've had Novocaine, I have trouble talking. So to speak and listen, there has to be an enormous cooperation across this broad band of fibers called the corpus callosum that connects the right and left hemispheres. When you write, you write with only one hand. I mean, for 5,000 years, up until the invention of the typewriter, keyboard, it didn't matter whether you were a man or a woman writing. It didn't matter what language you were writing in. It didn't even matter what you were writing about. The hand that controlled the writing implement is the same hand that hurls spears, swings swords, and pulls triggers. So it became very clear to me that a new form of communication that reinforces the left hemisphere of the brain at the expense of the right hemisphere will cause culture to veer off in a very left hemispheric mode. And the left hemisphere, um, you know, everyone agrees that they're a mixture of masculine and feminine traits. And within each individual, they're they're a mixture. Some people are, men are more, have a more masculine side than a feminine side, but men can't exist without a feminine side, just as women cannot exist without a masculine side. So everyone agrees with that concept. I would like to give them anatomical mailing addresses. I think that the processes that are primarily used for masculine thinking, and again, both men and women have these, are located primarily in the left hemisphere of both men and women who are right-handed, and the converse for the feminine in the right hemisphere. So what happens in a culture when the left hemisphere is given this extra power is that patriarchy and misogyny become evident in the culture. And these manifest themselves in a rather extraordinary way. Number one, image information is suppressed. Um, it becomes an abomination. Uh, women's rights are curtailed, and the goddess disappears. So that's the thesis of this book, and if you look in history and you see what happened, the first book that was ever written in an alphabet is the Old Testament. It's about 900 B.C. And in this book, the most important part of the Ten Commandments. The first commandment is the most revolutionary sentence ever transcribed. It says, I am the Lord thy God, there is no other. Now, the Old Testament doesn't actually state that this deity is a, is a male, but all of the nouns and adjectives used to describe this deity, Lord, ruler, host, king of the universe, they're all masculine. So it's safe to assume that this is a male deity. If he's the only one, then what the first commandment states is that there was no woman involved in the creation of the universe. And up until the time this sentence was written, there were no people anywhere in the world who ever believed that a man alone could create the universe. It was usually two women together, or a woman alone, or a man and a woman together, but never a man alone. Now, if I were to place the Ten Commandments on a table and ask the viewers to come up and put them in the order of sequence for their relative importance for their life today, I have no doubt that every single person would put as number two, don't murder. But that's not number two, that's number six. The second most important rule of righteous living is make no images. How strange. And for those that would argue that it's a, a prescription against graven images, if you read the commandment, it says, and thou shalt create no images of anything that flies in the air, creepeth in the ground, or is under the sea. In other words, no art. So the question is, why would art be more dangerous than murder? I mean, why was there a prescription against art that you see playing itself out every time a people become literate, uh, alphabet literate. 
So for example, the first act of the Orthodox Christians in 313 AD when they became the state religion of Rome were instructions to the minions to go into the streets and destroy all of the images, not just graven images, but every Greco-Roman image they could lay their hands on. And then after this incredible destruction of images, all the goddess temples were shut down. And then you have this extraordinary period in Western culture called the Dark Ages, where literacy got lost. And it was during this period of time when less than 1% of the population of Europe could read and write. So this was a time of uh, superstition and barbarity. And strife was the order of the day. Commerce dried to a trickle. Um, uh, travel was exceedingly dangerous. So you would think that this would be the period when women's rights would have thoroughly suffocated. But when the stage of history gets reilluminated in the ninth century, what you find is male troubadours all over Europe singing the praises of women. So you have um, uh, courtly love and the chivalric code. Women Christian mystics are hailed by the popes as having a clearer connection to the kingdom of heaven than the male clerics. It's always illiterate peasant girls that are having these visions that the church certifies. It isn't some law lawyer in the cleric's office uh, at, at the Vatican that's having these visions. It's always uh, peasant children. And then you have this extraordinary phenomenon that that the people of medieval Europe began to expend enormous sums of time, energy, and money erecting these fabulous cathedrals dedicated to Notre Dame. So the question is, where did Mary come from? Mary is mentioned eight times in the New Testament, in the Gospels. She's a peripheral character in the whole story, and yet during the medieval period, she becomes the central figure of Christianity. Now, Mary doesn't say anything. I mean, there's no Gospels according to Mary. It's her image that is everywhere. She, she's at every shop, bro, uh, shop wall and na church nave, and she leads every procession and at every crossroads. And the phenomenon of Mary reaches its height at the high Middle Ages. And the reason I believe that Mary is the resurgence of the earth goddess during a time of low literacy rates is you can travel in a wide arc through Poland, Switzerland, Germany, France, Spain, and you'll find a church somewhere is that they venerate a statue of a black Madonna. The question is, why would a Caucasian population who was substantially blonde and blue-eyed, why would they be venerating a statue of a black Madonna? And the answer to that is I think that all of the manifestations of the earth goddess were black. I mean, Kali was black, Artemis was black, Cybele was black, Athena was black, and the phenomenon disappears and begins to wane it, with the beginning of the Renaissance. And the Renaissance was this extraordinarily testosterone-driven surge of male creative energy driven by the left hemisphere that was supported by what Life magazine called the most important invention of the last thousand years, which is Gutenberg's printing press in 1453. And literacy rates that were in, in Western Europe were in the high teens in, in some of the cities with the invention of the printing press skyrocketed. So what happened is books became cheap, easy, and available, and everyone rushed to learn this new art called reading and writing, and because they all wanted to read this book that they had read so much about, or heard so much about, but was always locked up in, in a monastery somewhere. So once they read the book, which is indisputably, the New Testament is about love and kindness and forgiveness, Shouldn't it therefore follow that the people would behave towards each other in a loving, kind, and forgiving fashion? But that's not what happened. I mean, what happened is um, religious wars broke out all over Europe so that next-door neighbors began to murder their next-door neighbors. I mean, in France, the Huguenots and the Catholics killed each other with the most unbelievable ferocity. In England, Anglicans killed Presbyterians and Puritans killed Anglicans. In Germany, Calvinists and Lutherans were killing each other at the start of the Thirty Years' War before the Catholics and the Protestants squared off. And they killed one-third of the population of Germany and destroyed their economic base for a hundred years. In Spain, Jews and Moors had lived side by side with Catholics peacefully for, for centuries. And suddenly, the Catholics suddenly decided they couldn't tolerate the presence of Jews and Moors, and they had to either kill them or expel them. Now, if you're looking for this period of history in the history books, you'll find it under the heading, The Age of Reason. 
And it's really strange because this is the time in Western culture when the left brain is exercising and making the most extraordinary contributions in mathematics and architecture and global exploration. But evidence that some new factor had, was driving this culture mad is the fact that the men of this culture had suffered a psychosis so extreme that they thought that their women were so dangerous they needed to be murdered. And murder them they did. The witch hunts were the most severe, not in the Dark Ages, not during the bubonic plagues. They were the most severe in the Gilded Renaissance. The people that were bringing about the witch hunts were not the peasants. They were trying to protect their women. It was the lawyers and the doctors and the clerics and the priests. They were supporting the witch hunts. Now, if you were to go to a Polynesian or a, an Inuit or a Hopi or a Kung Bushman, and you were to tap them on the shoulder and say, say, would, uh, would you believe that there's a culture in the world where the men are murdering their wise women? I mean, they'd look at you in disbelief. They'd say, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. Everybody knows that the men are supposed to raid the next village and kill those men and steal their women. You don't kill your own women. There has never been an explanation for why sophisticated Europe, the only culture in the world that dined with a knife and a fork, killed their own women. The witch hunts were the most severe in those co countries that had the steepest rise in literacy rates. Germany, France, England, Switzerland, they had terrible witch hunts. Russia, which remained illiterate, did not have any witch hunts. Bosnia and Hungary, which were under Muslim rule, and the Muslims did not adopt the printing press to the 19th century, they didn't have any witch hunts. So it's a strange set of coincidences that you have these extraordinary developments. Now, what happened in the 19th century changed all this, and that was two things. One was the discovery of electromagnetism, and the other one was the invention of photography. Photography did for images what the printing press had done for the written word, made them cheap, easy, and available. By the end of the 19th century, there was virtually no one who had not sat for their photograph at least once. In the 200 years after the Protestant Reformation, if you were to ask people, your house is on fire, and you can run in and retrieve one personal object, what would it be? The answer would be the same. It would be the family Bible. Within one generation of the invention of photography, the answer changed. It became the family photo album. And then electromagnetism and photography have begun to weave, interweave, to bring forth new medium of communications based on images. The first one was film. Think of this, film attendance surpassed church attendance within eight years of its introduction, and it's never been close since. And then in the 1950s, all of the people who had been educated in the standard Western style, which is a very linear, sequential method of reading, writing, and arithmetic, suddenly had to contend with a new form of communication called television. And television completely upended our culture. Uh, television required a new hemispheric strategy to see television. And by that I mean if you put EEG leads in somebody's brain to measure their brain waves, and you give them a book to read, as McLuhan said, the medium is the message, it's the process. It doesn't matter what the content of the book is. It can be about sex and violence, it can be a mystery story, it could be a, a, a political book, it doesn't matter. The person generates beta waves. And beta waves are what you generate when you're concentrating on a task. So everyone knows that if you're trying to read a book, you have to concentrate. If you're in a real noisy room, you'll get up and you'll find some place to go sit that's quiet. But if you ask that person to look up from their book and to start watching a television program, it doesn't matter what the content of the program is. Uh, it can be cuddly koala bears or it can be some uh, violent uh, cops and robbers program. What happens is the beta waves go away and alpha and theta waves come up. And alpha and theta waves are what you generate when you meditate. I mean, who here has not had the experience of going home after a hard day's work and taking that clicker in your hand and just kind of going into a trance watching television? Uh, people, when asked, say that the word the most commonly used to describe watching television is hypnotizing. And if you look at it from another way, if you put somebody in a brain scanner and you give them a book to read and you're measuring their, their brain activity, it doesn't matter what the content of the book is. Any reading and writing generates the whole left hemisphere is all lit up and the right hemisphere is relatively dark. If you ask that person to look up from their book and start watching any television program, 
the left hemisphere goes dark, and the right hemisphere lights up. Now, in a world that has one television set for every two people on the planet, how could that not make a profound difference in our culture? So what's happened is that Western culture has been moved for 3,000 years by long, imageless tomes written by esteemed white males. I mean, Augustine, Aquinas, Marx, Hegel, Freud, those are the books that moved our culture. I challenge anybody to name a single book that's been written since the advent of television that has the power to change consciousness as much as images. I mean, we now live in a culture where we have a vir virtual archive in our brain of the most important events that have happened in our lifetime. If I mention little naked girl running down the street with her arms outstretched, I mean, I don't have to finish the sentence because most of your viewers know that I'm talking about that image from Vietnam, uh, from the Vietnam War. The image of the atomic bomb did more to change the consciousness of the planet than anything that was written about the atomic bomb. Does anybody doubt that the atomic bomb would have been used if there was only a written description of its effects? I mean, it was that film clip of this extraordinary power of the bomb that I think stayed the hands of people from using it um, uh, after it had been used in, in Japan. And alternately, the image that even more powerful than that was the Earth beam back from space in 68. People seeing this blue marble floating in this dark space were moved by not only the sheer beauty of this image, but the implications of seeing our world as one interconnected whole instead of some geographical map with artificial lines drawn on it. So I think that we're witnessing, um, and the reason that I think that you're able to even make this program now, is that we've exited 5,000 years of text a based culture. And it's only because we're, we're moving away from text information that we're able to d develop some degree of objectivity to look back at it and begin to assess what exactly was the effect on our human culture, particularly Western culture, because it's in, primarily in the West that the alphabet has played such an important role. And why is it that Western culture is so different from native culture, indigenous cultures, and eastern cultures, which don't use alphabets up until recently. And I think that McLuhan was absolutely right on the money when he said the medium is the message. The process by which we take in information and we put it out is very important. We know that babies come into the world with all these extra neurons in their brain. It's almost as if evolution said, okay, go learn something. So what is the effect of aiming a machine gun at a child's eye at about age five and firing in a steady stream of numbers and letters, numbers and letters, numbers and letters for the next 20 years? We know that there's a dying off of neurons that aren't used. So if you diminish the value of the three arts, which is dance, music, and art, and focus only on reading, writing, and arithmetic, which is all left hemispheric stuff, as opposed to primarily right hemispheric stuff, you're going to get a culture that's going to be very left hemispheric, very very macho, very yang, very beta mode. I mean, and that will manifest itself in the larger arena of world history. And in the alphabet versus the goddess, what I essentially do is show how these trends in, in history have played out against the backdrop of whether or not the culture was acquiring alphabet literacy or was losing it. And as a result, there was this extraordinary number of coincidences that you could say, well, maybe they're not causal, they're just coincidences, but they require some explanation. historical story archaeological linguists had traced back
exact words, you know, the alphabet. Right, the giving. Yes. The giving of the Ten yes. Commandments to Moses. Yes. Well, I, I um, you know, the oldest alphabet uh, ever discovered is called the Proto-Sinaitic Proto Alphabet. And it dates to about 1800 BC, where on a temple dedicated to a goddess, they found what looks like the very first beginnings of an alphabet. And this was in an area of the Sinai that the Midianites um, were traveling through. And the Midianites were the family that Moses married into uh, when he ran away from Egypt after killing this overseer. So I find it as an extraordinary coincidence that the most important event memorialized in the Israelite and Hebrew and Jewish religion is the giving of the Ten Commandments that take place at the foot of Mount Sinai. If you mention the name Sinai to a group of people, if you, you know, for example, Nineveh or Karnak or Luxor, I mean, these names are redolent with enormous events and wars and battles and whatnot. If you mention the name Sinai to anybody historically, there's only one event that's associated with the Sinai, and that is the giving of the Ten Commandments. And I think it's amazing that the oldest alphabet ever discovered was in the Sinai. So the question is, was the enormous event that really happened there the invention of the alphabet? Was Moses the first wordsmith? Was what was what was the giving of the, the the law and the Ten Commandments really the ability of the first people, the common people, to be able to learn a process of communicating using twenty six little squiggles that really are just um, stand for uh, sounds and are able to be arranged in such a way that it makes it very easy to communicate. Relative to this initial invention, there's uh, a couple of different theories as to the reason that it was created or the background pressure that created it. There's uh, articulatory theory, that it was a bilateral rotation of these facial expressions that would allow a trader in a bazaar to basically note-take any language and be able mm. to play it back as a transcription system. That's uh, Robin Allot's work. And then there's the acrophonic, uh, having taken the first letter. Which of those do you... Well, I, I, I would subscribe to the fact that it was a... Um, y you know, it's interesting that it developed in a place somewhere halfway between Egypt and Mesopotamia. So here you had these two very different writing systems, cuneiform, which was these very complicated wedge system, and then hieroglyphics, which is based on images. So it's sort of an iconic, almost a hieroglyphic form of language. And whoever, the traders that go back and forth between these two empires, and we know that the story of Abraham, as he starts out in Mesopotamia in the city of Ur, and then he, and he's told to go to Egypt, so he goes to Egypt, and all it takes is a, a pollinator from cross cultures who sees these are the advantages of this system, these are the advantages of this system, and then combine the two and make it simple. So the cuneiform was based on a linear sequential syllabary, and then the hieroglyphics were based on a different principle. So whoever came up with the idea of the alphabet, and everyone says it was the Phoenicians, based on what something that Herodotus said in his... Uh, that the, the Phoenicians taught it to the Greeks. But if the Phoenicians invented the alphabet, what did they write in it? I mean, when somebody invents a new form of communication, they leave you a written record. Can anybody name a significant document ever written uh, by Phoenicians? Was there any books written by Phoenicians? Is there a single anything left that they wrote? The first book of any consequence written in the alphabet is the Old Testament, 900 B.C., and then the Iliad is 800 B.C. So you have the... Jews and the Greeks, uh, Jerusalem and Athens, that form the two major currents that are the foundation of Western culture. I mean, our law, our morality, our philosophy, our science, all come from those two entirely different streams. The, um, just to close those other points, 
the whole story of Moses was uh, somebody learned in the Egyptian system moving in to become a significant uh, man, uh, shepherd, uh, right. operator in the uh, Jewish tribe. Well, what's interesting is that when he, he leaves Egypt, he goes and marries Zipporah, who was the daughter of Jethro, who was a Midianite priest. And the Midianites lived pretty west uh, of, uh, excuse me, pretty east of the Nile. So what intrigues me about that story is that um, Moses ends up, he had a speech defect. The, the Bible tells us, he says, I am not um, swift of speech. So we think that he had a stammer or um, uh, some stutter. So when somebody has a speech defect, they're looking for a better way to communicate. And he would be the ideal person to be the one to have first introduced a simpler way to read and write. But you have to understand that there were other people that were experimenting, the Canaanites, the Midianites. They must have all been experimenting with this system because they needed a simple way to learn how to read and write. You know, and these other two systems were way too complicated. So I think it was probably some collaborative effort, but it always takes one genius to say, what and what better way to, to inspire people to want to learn how to read and write this new form of language than to say that this is given to you in the moving, written by the moving finger of God. Um, so you're attributing the, <clears throat> the influence of the alphabet on the on consciousness and the way people would think, and what would happen to their brain, how they would chop and dice and process reality, and that that is, is somehow underlying the uh, emergence of this uh, level of uh, artificial abstraction, this process that would lead to uh, the codification of legal systems and the uh, development of the complex civilization, organization system. Forth. Speak to the relationship between what the alphabet processing implications are on the brain and how that relates to the nubs of start right. of these different uh, right. components of civilization. I mean, I, I find it to be an extraordinary coincidence that the concept of a written law, a body of law, only developed in alphabet nations. So you have the Israelites that have the Ten Commandments, then you have uh, uh, Roman law, and then you have common, English common law, and then you have the U.S. Constitution and the Magna Carta. Isn't it interesting that Egypt and China, which made enormous contributions to the storehouse of human civilization, that written codes of law were not among them. Uh, when we went into Japan after World War II, we had to give them a constitution. They had no concept of a society ruled by law. And I think that the concept of the law comes from alphabet literacy because, you know, Marshall McLuhan pointed out that no one in an uh, indigenous society ever corrects somebody for making a grammatical mistake. I mean, nobody, two Hopi Indians talking to each other don't say, excuse me, you just put the direct object in front of the indirect object and you ended your sentence with a preposition. It just doesn't happen. But once, you know, learning how to, re learning how to speak is something that is Chomsky is pointed out as this deep structure, this that we're born with the ability to pick up any grammar that we first hear. So every child can learn whatever language they're born into. But no child is born with the ability to learn how to read and write. This is a process that's extraordinarily complicated and much different than listening and speaking. So what has to happen is this um, changeover and the brain has to be reconfigured. Now, there's a group in, um, in uh, northern Portugal where a fishing village where the older generation uh, were, were non-literate. And then they open up public schools and the younger generation were literate. So a group of neuroscientists from Portugal and Sweden brought in these uh, two groups and did brain scans on them. And as you would anticipate, the brain scan of somebody who learns literacy is markedly different than the brain scan of somebody who's non-literate. 
Because if you're living in an auditory world as opposed to a visual world, where you're reducing sound to uh, visual marks on a piece of paper, it requires a whole different set of connections. Uh, you know, what most people in a literate world have failed to notice is that you trade an ear for an eye. You know, your, your vision becomes crucial in reading and writing as opposed to your ear, which is listening. So as a result, there's, there has to be a, sh a neurological, neuro, a, a shift in the neurocircuitry of the brain and up to now, no one has looked at what effect does that have on the wider issues of history, culture, religion, uh, gender relationships, and I think it affects all of them. Um, I'm going to come back to the neural circuitry question, which is very important in what we're doing. In the world. But I want to go back to establish a couple of more historical pieces. With respect to, um, there are a number of uh, scholars, McLuhan and his group, and, and you indicate this in your book, who are basically, it seems to me, saying that the explosion of Western civilization that we first see, that we first recognize and call as such in the emergence of Greek civilization is, is really connected. It's almost like they're inseminated by the, the Phoenicians with this viral, alphabetic right. uh, uh, mind germ. Right. And that enables them to just explode out into, I mean, it took a few hundred years from right. the time that it was first introduced right. until it caught on a certain right. level. But that, in a way, Western civilization the operating system, the OS of Western civilization through the alphabet. Well, well I... I I, I'm intrigued by the fact that in the English language there are only two usages of the two common usages of the word hemisphere. If you're if you're speaking and you want to use the word hemisphere in a sentence, you're either talking about the hemispheres of the planet or the hemispheres of the brain. And isn't it interesting that the planet has two very distinctive cultures, east and west, and the brain has two functionally lateralized hemispheres, right and left. And if you look at these differences, you'll notice that the the um, religion, the art, the language, the writing systems, and the kind of philosophy that exists in the East is primarily the kind of thinking processes that go on in the right hemisphere. And the processes that go on in the left hemisphere correlate to all those things that I talked about in the Western culture. So for example, our religions in the West are all based and rooted in alphabetic sacred texts whether it's the Old Testament, the New Testament, or the Koran. And, the, you know, it's basically in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was of God, and the Word is God. And then in the East, you have Lao Tzu saying, the way that can be spoken is not the way. He who knows does not speak, and he who speaks does not know. So it's sort of this intuitive, nonverbal knowledge that the right hemisphere is expert at compared to the kind of linear, sequential, black and white, written in a book, kind of information that the West um, has. And I think that the reason that the East and the West developed in such extraordinarily different ways is our writing systems. I mean, if, if a Chinese ideograph, for example, can have up to eight different concepts within one image, and when you see this image, you see it all at once. It's a gestalt. If you were to write out on a piece of paper all of those images in an that in an alphabetic language, it'll take you pages. You have to do it in a linear, sequential fashion. They did a fascinating study on Chinese Americans who, who were born in this country and learned how to speak and write both English and Chinese as small children. And then this select group either had a brain tumor or a stroke or some damage to one or the other of their hemispheres later in their life. And somebody examined these people, and this is what they found. If a right-handed Chinese American, who has their speech centers primarily in their left hemisphere, had a stroke in their left hemisphere, they lost the ability to speak English, they lost the ability to speak Chinese, and they couldn't write English. But they could still write Chinese. Because Chinese ideographic writing is an image gestalt-based form of writing that is primarily processed by the right hemisphere. 
if that same group of people, somebody had a stroke in their right hemisphere, they could speak English, they could speak Chinese, and they could write English, but they can no longer write Chinese. So it's clear that the writing systems of the world have layered out into different hemispheres. And the implications for understanding history and understanding these cultures is profound because if the brain is actually structured differently, then communication between people of these different cultures is going to be different. There's no doubt that anyone in a literate culture who interacts with somebody in a non-literate culture, that the people in the non-literate culture have a very different worldview about space and time, about um, uh, how they perceive the world. It, you know, Benjamin Lee Worf and Edward Sapir, and uh, uh, when they first, you know, all the other linguists were studying these um, in, uh, European languages, and they studied these um, Native American languages, and they found that the thought processes were profoundly different. And there can be no doubt that the reason that it's profoundly different is that they didn't have an alphabetic writing system to reconfigure their brain so that they thought in a certain way. I mean, it's no coincidence that when the West conquered much of and colonized much of the world, first came the conquistadors, and right behind them came the missionaries. And the first thing that the missionaries said, we're going to teach you how to read and write. And then once they learned how to read and write, they were into enfolded into Western religions. And um, this whole structure of thought, like uh, Abraham points to about uh, the birth of generalization. Right. Uh, that, that, that there's a point at which learning to become literate holds back, even on the people that don't become literate, because it changes the oral, the structures in the oral language. Well, I, I, I think that, you know, the, the story in Genesis about the fall is really about our fall into consciousness. You know, we, we humans develop this ego consciousness that allows us to come out of nature and look back at nature. So we develop this dualistic, objectified, so we're able to look back on things, and that was a big plus, but it also meant that we were no longer saw ourselves within the matrix of nature. Now, if you add onto that layer, learning how to read and write, it even creates another filter so that people become so divorced from nature that they can treat nature as if it was an object. And um, what we see with the ravaging of our environment, uh, that a lot of that is done with an unconcern that would not be present among people who are non-literate. That it seems like it almost takes this blinders of, of a literate uh, form of consciousness. And I, I don't want to make it sound like people shouldn't read and write anymore. I mean, you know, reading and writing is an incredible skill that gives you access to information you wouldn't be able to get any other way. But I think that we in the West in particular have been stuck for too long using primarily one hemisphere. It's been um, initially bad for, for women. Later, with the um, dissemination of universal law, then these inequities get leveled out and then women achieve equal rights. But these other cultures didn't have witch hunts, and um, we did. And there, there's never been an explanation for why that happened. How are you doing, Ted? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> speak for a moment about the, rather than at this deeper level of its effect on consciousness and processing and brain lateralization, and specialization, and polarization. Hemispheric biases. Go to a, a more surf, surface, superficial level about the utility differences. I mean, of the alphabet as distinct from other writing systems. I mean, you you mentioned earlier that the complex, almost cryptic nature of the writing systems prior to the alphabet were such that it required a 
level of training that only a few percent of the population did, and they right. became the gatekeepers and communicators right. for everybody else. I mean, the alphabet is the point at which it went from being this highly specialized, scribe-controlled uh, you know, religion of communication to something that was more uh, accessible in a widespread way. And that, connect, that connects up with allowing uh, a new civil infrastructure to form, a new communication system, the kind of World Wide Web One right. that the alphabet makes possible. And so just in terms of the technical aspects of the, of the thing as a technology, the kind of yeah. communication it enabled that you could say was a fulcrum for lifting and inventing civilization. Speak to that. Right. You know, in a culture that there's only a, a small percentage of people that are literate, they gain control because literate people have a means, uh, have an advantage over non-literate people because of their ability to communicate in this form. And people that have, are in control don't want to share this power. So they make it real difficult for anybody else to learn this form of writing. But once you have an alphabet, no one can keep that information from the masses because it's just too simple. It's just very easy to learn how to read and write. Uh, we know that the reason that the Christian church made such an impact on the medieval period is that the only people that were literate in Europe were the church, you know, and the rest of the people were not, and the, they were able to supplant all of the other indigenous religions uh, with Christianity and throughout Europe. And that was largely due to the fact that the church was literate and nobody else was. So what happens when... Um, um, when you, you have to learn uh, alphabet literacy, it, it, it's, a, um, it's a reductionist process because it's the linear arrangement of these letters that produces meaning. Um, so it forces you to think in a very linear and sequential fashion. I mean, you know, in Chinese, for example, um, uh, you, the word ma, which means mother, uh, if, depending upon how it's pronounced and de depending upon where it's in the sentence can have a totally different meaning. But in English, the word mother, whether you pronounce it mother or mother, or mo it's still mother. I mean, so there's a certain concreteness and reductionistic form of thinking that is ingrained in the mind of people that they tend to think in a very cause and effect, one thing after another, linear sequential way when you learn an alphabet. You know, alphabets proceed, you know, line by line, line by line, and that ingrains a certain way of thinking that then produces the kind of science. You know, why is it that science developed in the West uh, theoretical science developed in the West, but not, it never got very advanced in the East, you know, or these other cultures. So there's something about the process of becoming alphabet literate that changes the world that you're in. Um, <clears throat> let's go back to the point at which the alphabet pops into. Three, three starts to, to flower. How? What did the? Uh, how were the writing systems used, and how is it that the right that, that being able to have broader, widespread literacy enabled the kind of civilization infrastructure that that created the West? Well, he, he, here you have. It's the story of two city states. Okay, you have Sparta and Athens right next door to each other. They're both contemporaneous. They both worship the same gods. They speak the same language. No one has read anything written by a Spartan because they didn't leave a written record. They had an extraordinary society where they had a, a system of law that had to be memorized. And it, on pain of death, you never told anybody else about the law. Right next door was Athens that embraced the written word, produced this extraordinary outpouring of Euripides and Sophocles and Plato and Aristotle. And they, they wrote a lot of what they said down. And you have these two different societies that were very different. For example, you would think that a culture that, like the Athenian one, where they sat around and discussed the merits of democracy and the aesthetics of art, that they would have treated women better. 
But in Athens, women were not allowed to own property. They could not be publicly educated. They could not participate in politics. And right next door in Sparta, the girls could compete in the games. They could be queens. They owned property. They led armies. I mean, it was quite extraordinary that they had such a different, right, that's just one aspect of these two cultures. So we see in Greece that the, um, that the, the Greeks had a golden circle of, of 12 deities on Mount Olympus. And isn't it interesting that at the time of the fourth century BC, at the height of, of the Greek embrace of the alphabet when they started making these, the golden age of Greece, that that was the time when the Greeks collectively decided that there was something wrong with Mount Olympus, that one of the deities, they needed to make room for a new deity. So they demoted Hestia, who was the goddess of the hearth and home, and elevated Dionysius, who was the god of madness and creativity, to this position to sit next to Apollo uh, and become part of the golden circle. Now Dionysius represents not only the sensuality and the madness that has to be balanced whenever a culture becomes so rational and logical and linear that it produces a, an imbalance. And then, so you have people worshiping this strange deity that was a cannibal god. Um, the Dionysian rites is practiced and was the fastest growing cult in ancient Greece um, at a time when um, they were becoming the most rational. And Dionysius combined two aspects. It was a very spiritual side and a very um, hedonistic side. So when the Romans conquered the Greeks, they took Dionysius and they split him into two. And he became Bacchus. This, uh, the, they named Bacchanals after him. You know, this sort of drunken, sexual orgy type of, of deity. And then the other part of him was Orpheus, who was this gentle poet musician that was very spiritual, that died. He was killed and he died. And then he came back to life. So when early Christianity began, they took the story of Orpheus and attached it to Jesus. And they took the story of Bacchus and attached it to the devil. So you had this, you know, dark and light, good and bad and good and evil that is the strain that runs through Greek and Roman uh, religious ideas that manifest themselves in our current religion. You had this other critical part of the alphabet, and that is that the printing press was invented in China during the Sung Dynasty in about 9 AD. And then a Korean uh, invented metal movable type. So this was long before Gutenberg ever invented this. But the problem was, is that the Korean and Chinese printers needed to have a bin with an enormous number of blocks for printing because their language was not alphabetized. So Gutenberg only needed to set up maybe 26 or 30 bins with the letter A and the letter P and the letter C, and the speed with which they could s set up a line of print for the printing press was much faster than any Chinese or Korean printer could do. So it was like this invention that spread printing, which transformed the world. Um, what did I read the other day that there was, um, that printing spread so rapidly that there were like 8,000 books in Europe, um, printed books in, eight, in, 14, in the 1450s, and by the end of the century there were 8 million copies. So, I mean, it just made books available to people. And the more books you have, the more incentive there is for people to learn how to read them, and the more ease with which ideas can be transferred. So the printing press was an iteration, a, a means of just producing the same thing over and over and over again and spread ideas. You know, Luther could never have brought about the Reformation without printing. Um, and you, you see how scientific ideas spread through Europe through journals 
and the, the Royal Society and people having publications, that instead of writing a laborious letter to one person, you, you could have this thing printed and send it to a whole bunch of people. So there is this aspect to the alphabet that is the ease with which it can be used with a printing press and its ability to store and retrieve information that are secondary to its main function, which is to transfer information. Um, but the problem is, is that alphabets tend to produce schismatic religions. It tends to produce uh, a Tower of Babel. So whereas a Chinese scholar anywhere in China, even though they may speak a dialect that they can't understand each other, they can all read the same language. Um, they can all read the ancient Chinese texts because they're written in a way that's understandable. Whereas we can barely read Shakespeare's English, you know, um, Middle English. And what's happened is that even though everybody in the West uses an alphabet, if you're a Portuguese writer writing to a German um, reader, you may be using the same alphabet, but it's, it's broken down into all these incommunicable means to talk to each other. So whereas the, the East tends to have this holistic system of holding everything together, the West keeps breaking down and breaking down and breaking down. When you think of all the Protestant denominations and you think of all the schisms within the, the church and all the bifurcations of all the Shiites and the Sunnis and, and you realize that in the West, we kill each other over religion. I mean, in the East, you can be a Buddhist, a Taoist, a Confucian, and a Shintoist. All at the same time, it's not a problem. In the West, you can't be a Jew and a Catholic and a Muslim and a Protestant all at the same time. It's impossible. So one of the reasons I wrote Alphabet versus the Goddess is I wanted to try to understand if there was a time in the world when nobody killed each other over religion. I mean... If you wanted to worship Apollo and I wanted to worship Athena, no problem. I mean, they killed each other for a lot of different reasons, but religious ideology was never one of them. And then there came a time in the world, only in the West, that people killed each other over religion, and they were killing each other over the most minor doctrinal disputes. I mean, Jews and Catholics and Protestants and Muslims all agree that they're all worshiping the same deity whether it's Yahweh or God Almighty or, or Allah, it's the same entity. So why are we killing each other? I mean, it's so profoundly, and it's all due to the fact that we have alphabetic sacred texts. And my text is different from your text, and my text contains the truth, and your text isn't, so therefore we'll kill each other over it. So it's a very strange phenomenon because you don't have that in the other religions of the world. Strong correlate, right? Exactly. They're, they're co implicated. Yes, with each other. exactly. Oh, they're, what are the steps of their causality? Right. The connection of causality is another. Um, but, so, what I heard you say about back to the beginning point was that the alphabet gave rise to. a way of thinking about organizing. Exactly. Right? Exactly. It, 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 it promoted, gee, we can think about how to organize this. Right. You could, you could alphabetize information so it could be stored in a library. You, you know, you know my, my thesis is that the limit of human intelligence was set by the diameter of the female's pelvis. Yes. I mean, you know, you, know, you couldn't get a bigger brain through that little tiny hole. So, so the solution that evolution came up with was extraordinary, and that is get the baby past that terrible birth canal, which is so life-threatening to both mother and baby, and once the baby's on the other side of the mother's pelvic ring of bone, ladled back into the baby's brain the missing pieces that the baby needs to know to function in the world. So we call it culture, and the astonishing new adaptation that was developed by evolution to ladle those pieces back in was language. But then we went beyond that, and we started to develop Extra, extra nervous system outside of our nervous system means so that the first form was writing. Writing is a peripheral, like a computer has some peripherals. It's, it's just another piece that's sitting on the desk over here, 
and it, it, it aids the central computer, the brain. So once you have writing, then you have libraries, and then you now have you know, these extraordinary uh, means of the internet and, and movies and television. You can store information in cans and on magnetic tapes. And these are all manifestations of the extension of our nervous system outside of our skull. The reason my computer is colored gray is that it's a piece of my brain sitting on my desk. It just doesn't happen to be wet, you know, but I mean, it's, it's an extension of my nervous system. So we humans have figured out a way to beat that limit of how big our brain can be by adding onto our brain outside of our skull information devices like libraries and books and movies that allow us to store information and retrieve it in an extraordinarily easy way. Right, that's one of my favorite points too. And yeah. And my, my view on that is that, that the instinctual yoke of nature got broke. Right. Right, and we became more dependent on learning. Right. Than on instinct. Right. And well, you know, it's that. Rise to all kinds yeah, of it's that, that uh, Richard Dawkins, the mem, yeah. you know, the mem replaces the, DN the gene, you know, that an idea can live out beyond you, you know, and, and we, we've short circuited the whole process of evolution. We don't need genetic mutations. I mean, if I wanted to have a child that knew to look both ways before crossing the street and I had to wait for a genetic mutation, I'd have to have millions of years go by with kids getting run over. Before one would stabilize. develop a gene that mutation that they'd look both ways. I can short circuit that whole process by simply teaching the child to look both ways. By explicitly learning together. Exactly. Which is what humans do. Exactly. Other, you know, right. Exactly. Which is a, a core of our work. Is exactly. How we do that. Um, okay, so we touched on the organization. I, I, this is the thing. I'm trying to say, okay, the, the alphabet provided a, this a medium. It's a medium. It's uh it was a net. It, it, it was a net. World Wide Web net yeah. one. Yeah. Artificial reality two. Right. It was a net that allowed, you know, prior to a writing system, you, you have to remember that the Mesopotamians invented cuneiform and they were using it for business transactions because commerce became so complicated that they needed to keep track of I giving you eight uh, sheaves of grain and you're giving me four jars of oil and next year I'm going to be doing... They used that system for 800 years before somebody figured out that you could actually use this writing system to tell our stories, to, to keep our king's lists, to write our poetry and tell our mythology. So, so it was a long time before they finally figured out that this new means of communication could have another use. And alphabets um, just speeded up the process tremendously, and that um, we were able to uh, just blossom out as a result of learning the alphabet. But in the process, you know, there's no free lunches in the universe. Sophocles once warned that nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. And I think everyone would agree with that. If you won the lottery tomorrow and you got all those millions of dollars, you could count on something unpleasant happening as a result of that. Everyone would agree that the invention of the alphabet was vast. So the question is, what was the curse? What was the price that we paid as a species to learn this magnificent gift? Because all magnificent gifts come with a price. And the price has been that it's, it's changed the way we communicate and interact with both our, each other and nature in such a way that has been detrimental um, in many respects. So it has not been an unvarnished good. Um, even though the good that it has brought, I certainly wouldn't want to go back on that. I mean, it's a tremendous. But we're now starting to assess what was the cost? What was the price that we paid to become literate? Um, so I'll give you a little sketch of what we're doing so we can understand how these okay. connect. As you probably know, the, I'm sure you do from, from your work, there, for the longest time, there was what we even call today, based on the misattribution to the Phoenicians, a phonetic correspondence between letters and sounds. 
in Plato's day. In fact, we have a quote from Plato, and this says, once we knew the letters of the alphabet, we could read. Reading was a case of see the letters, say the sound, do it fast enough. It was like cueing speech. You could hear it. It was like you're talking to yourself, talking to somebody else. That was reading. We were mentioning earlier the Romans improved it with punctuation, and you told a story that added to that. So that it started to evolve into this general form that starts to become more familiar to us. But the Romans spread this system all around Europe, and as they wither and die, they leave it. it, it it's the medium that the powers of Europe are growing up in. Right. The common people aren't, but the powers are. Right, aren't. right. So these people are speaking, writing, conditioning, their minds are being conditioned by this writing system. And it's spoken system, which has this pretty much clear correspondence. Right. But the, the problem is, in England in particular, in our case, the um, common people are speaking a language that has 40 plus sounds. There isn't enough letters to cover the sounds. Right. They, the people that are in control, so to speak, watching the store responsible for all this, really don't care that much about the people and their 40 sound element spoken language. They want to, they live inside the language that's powering them, which is right. with its right, right, right. system. Right. So over a period of time, a crude um, collision, juxtapositioning begins to happen, where these insufficient number of letters are, are pair bonded and otherwise structured to represent the sounds in the English language that we don't have enough letters for. Right. Well, it's, um, th there's an interesting concept that language is an entity. It's an ectoplasmic, doesn't have a body. And it's living symbiotically with humans. And humans can't live without language, and language can't live without humans. So there's something new in the world in terms of evolution in that for the first time we have an organism that you can't actually see. It doesn't have a corporeal body, but it, it exists. It, 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 if you took all language as a whole, it's this thing that we humans generate, and it, and it, and it has an almost amorphous life of its own. Um, and, and the languages are living things. I mean, some of them die, some of them live, some, the, the strongest survive. Um, I happen to think that English is an extraordinary good choice for becoming the world language because um, in French, German, Spanish, and Italian, if you want to, a, a two-year-old has to learn that all nouns have a value and the value is sexual. So that, well, what a strange concept, that a noun has to have a gender article that's masculine or feminine. And you could sort of figure out, if we're using a little rustic barnyard common sense, that the drills and the forks and the knives are masculine and the windows and the vessels and the thresholds are feminine. But once you get into the abstract nouns, why is it that the majority of abstract nouns that are negative, such as sickness and folly and foible and disability are feminine and the ma and the majority of masculine nouns are positive so what does that do in a culture if little girls learn that the good nouns belong to the guys what does that do to their self-esteem and what does that do to a little boy in terms of of how he's going to relate to the opposite sex and then you have this extraordinary phenomenon that in all those languages, well, in English, there are no gender articles. There's none, zero, zip. There's no noun that has a gender article. And if, if I want to address you in German, Spanish, French, or Italian, just as I start to address you, I have to make a decision whether or not I can address you with the familiar or the uh, formal. Richard Feynman has a fantastic, there's a fantastic story about him going to Japan once to have a conference with a bunch of Japanese physicists. And in the course of that, uh, learning all the different inflections he had to do in order to be properly honoring or distancing himself right. relative to the, this incredible social 
uh, hierarchy of uh, placements. Right. And uh, that's when he finally said, oh, I don't want to learn that language. Well, so the, well you have a built-in hierarchy and a built-in gender patriarchy and misogyny in all these languages, except English, because in English, all I can address you is you. And we'll point out the thing I'm trying to get to is, is that the English is a different problem. While on the one hand, it's got this fantastic um, dexterity and freedom from a lot of the overhead that you're describing. On the other hand, um, English and the Romance languages where there is this schism between sounds and letters requires a new processing root form a new set of decoding reflexes, which were not part of the original written system. But we're, we're getting beyond that because what's happening is that our language is evolving into an, I, I call it the iconic revolution. I mean, if you're looking for the men's room, don't look for MEN anymore. I mean, it's a little icon of a man or a woman. So what's happening is that when I grew up, all the road signs were in text. And now all the road signs are in icons. If you're going to a hospital or an airport, you know, you're looking for something, you don't see the signs and text anymore. It, what, what's happening is that we're developing a hieroglyphic form of writing is coming back so that images that are re easily recognizable to anybody regardless of what language they read in alphabets or non-alphabets, that they can recognize these icons. So, you know, Volt at the... When we're likely to have some kind of a writing system that actually replaces our current writing... Well, it's system. happening. It's, it's in the process. You know, Vol Voltaire recommended, uh, you know, in the in French Enlightenment that we needed to get rid of all the uh, European languages, written languages, because there were, a Frenchman couldn't talk to a German and an Englishman, you know, there was this Tower of Babel. And he said, let's use Chinese. Let's use ideograms that are understandable to everybody. It's not based on phonetics. It's just based on gestalt recognition. And of course, that movement never got took off. And then at the end of the 19th century, this Esperanto movement came, which was sort of make a mongrel out of all these different languages, and maybe everybody will understand them. It never caught on. What's catching on today is the iconic form of language, so that wherever you go today, there are now images, icons, hieroglyphs that convey information that used to be written out in text. I, I, I see that. And at the same time, 92 million adults can't read above a fifth grade level. Right. Losing hundreds of billions of dollars. Right. Living impoverished lives right. because they were fated by not being able to read well. Right. 35 million children are trapped in a public school system in which 60% or so are below the level of proficiency, and research says they're feeling ashamed of their minds. Sure, because sure, sure. So there, <clears throat> there's been attempts to change the writing system, as you know, from Benjamin Franklin, who's my sure. favorite hero in this story, right. uh, up until the er early uh, 20th century. There was change, attempt after attempt after attempt to say, look, this thing is messing with the sure. quality of life of our people. It's retarding the advance of our right. language around the world. What are we going to do about it? They rose to... to Try to intentionally do something about it, and it all got snuffed, right. and wiped out. Right. And so, while I do think, given a large, grand view, that we're going to end up with a, and a more of an iconic writing system that has some benefits of both in the new, new hyper technologies that right. possible organizations right. of images that couldn't have been done before, and all of that stuff. Right now, we're still trapped in this situation where you know, millions and millions of people's lives are suffering on the on-ramp into literacy that's required today to live in the world. You know, um, Marshall McLuhan said that at the interface mm -hmm. between the changeover from one major form of communication to another form, there's an enormous explosion of energy released, much of it creative and some of it very destructive. And what you're talking about, I believe, this um, literacy rates falling uh, dramatically around the world, in, well, not around the world, but primarily in the developed nations, is, is because the school system that was designed for a society that were bringing people into this uh, educational system to teach them how to read and write, they now have to compete with an alternative um, school system, which is television and movies. And now children are being exposed on a daily basis to an enormous amount of image information that is competing with 
the kind of linear sequential um, ingraining that has to happen in order to teach people how to read and write. So there's this collision between these two forms of communication that on the one hand is producing a true level of creativity in our society that in some future age will be talked about as a golden age or a renaissance, but at the same time you're getting this extraordinary fallout of kids and people that are being left behind because they don't know how to read and write. It's a terrible problem and, and, um, and it's um, something that has happened every time a culture comes in contact with a new form of communication.